Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Thanks again, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here, the Oregon Voters Digest. As you know, we've been doing uh, some, some uh, series, if you will, on my whole issue of police, and we were and we we're fortunate to be able to talk about the subject with someone that that's very familiar here within the Portland metropolitan area. And I'm talking about Don Gray. I mean, he was actually a Portland policeman, Portland cop, Portland law enforcement person. And he's written a book, Behind the Badge in River City. It's a very interesting book. I had the opportunity to read the book, and and uh, it was it was just it was enlightening. But besides that, he's been on the show now about a couple of times already, and. Uh, so far, and um, it's interesting about some of the comments that were being made. I, I don't know if you had the opportunity to have looked at the show, but you can go to YouTube and pick up the pick up the last two shows. And um, so it's been very interesting. And as you note, um, uh, within the country, for that matter, we're having some major issues trying to figure out what are we going to do about public safety. And uh, it's a very difficult situation. It's sort of like a crisis, Amber. But, but I can tell you for sure that my experience after reading the book if you will, and having had the opportunity to interview Don and sharing him with you, for that matter, uh, it's it's been very enlightening. It's been a lot of things that I've learned, and uh, and and okay, giving me a better feel of in terms of what direction we need to go in. And uh, so I want to thank you, Don. And right before we get to this particular piece, I want to thank you very much. And I want to thank you for those out there who are watching too, because you have really helped us help the folks out. Because at the Good. bottom line, what I really learned, and and I've talked to a number of people about it, is that. Uh, uh, now I have some idea who's responsible. Yes, we are. We are. We are the public, the voter, are. and 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 the basically we've uh, we've we hire a person to basically take our take that task. We've given them a job, and that's the elected officials. Mm -hmm. We've got to pay more attention about the people that we elect to office. Yeah. And in this particular case, and I'm not picking on any particular person right now, but Charlie Hill happens to be the mayor. But we we need to we got an upcoming mayoral election, and this is going to be a definitely the, at the front of the line, if if you will, with reference to how do we deal with the issue. Oh. It's not the police person. That person has got to do a job. They got to get out there and do a job, and that's a tough tough job. I've learned that as I just sitting there listening to you. Besides that, after even after the show and aspect of it, so again we want to thank you very much for for giving us the, the opportunity to that you were able to share with you us uh, the, the the background of, of being a policeman and this that, and that now I think we can go forward yes now I also brought along a, a person who was very instrumental in uh, in putting this piece together I, I know you were the publisher you had to you had to talk to someone yeah and uh, and that has to be the editor someone that can they put it in, in such a fashion that, that one can communicate with it and she's right here she just happens to be your partner okay and I'm talking about Teresa and Teresa uh, Teresa Dupe, and, and it's been. Uh, I want to thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for stopping Don long enough because I knew he had all those papers all over the place, mm -hmm. all the boxes and this, that, and the other. And uh, you know, but my point is that it's tough to write a good book. It, I mean, to communicate, if you will. Yeah. You know, it's one thing you can communicate. I can be, but I, I can't write a book. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> and uh, slow him down enough to really point to get the points out and this, that, and the other. And so I want to thank you for doing this, and it's, it's been just fantastic. But what we're going to do also, too, at this point in time, I'm going to ask Don a couple of questions, and then after that, I want to ask you a few, a few okay. questions, okay? All right. Don, let's, let's talk about, uh, I only have about three questions here. I figured I'd just, just jot them out real quick. What projects are you working on now? Well, Bruce, uh, this book <clears throat> is about what went on in the 60s in the Albina District. Uh, and I want people to understand right up front that I've never been anti-police. This is not an anti-police right. book. Uh, I am and always have been anti-abuse. Uh, people who disregard the Constitution uh, are n not our friends. So it's not about hating the cops. It's about uh, holding people responsible that need to be responsible. Now, what am I working on for the summer? Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, of course, writers write. That's what we do. And uh, I'm writing another book. It's called uh, The Four Stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, be from the Hollywood Theater to the Benson Hotel. Mm -hmm. And it's not about police work, so we're not going to talk particularly about that tonight. But that's what I'm working on. It's a, it's a good book about what it's like in growing up in the 1950s in the Portland area where I lived in Hollywood District. And the Hollywood Theater was a, a big 
a okay. big deal to me because that's where we went every Saturday afternoon right. Right. to the matinees yeah. to watch Roy Rogers and, yeah, I got you. and the singing cowboys. You got the bug. That's I what got you're telling. You got, got the bug, bug now. I got you, the bug. And you're still yeah. going to school, right? You'll be, you'll be so graduating much. pretty soon too, right? Aren't you? Well, I'm not in any particular hurry. Right, Bruce, right. I, I, I noticed however, that. However, I noticed that. However, I am working on a degree, and okay. uh, sometime in the next two years. I will graduate. Yeah. I think you will now, especially oh. with Teresa sitting there by no, Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> they, You know, but before absolutely. we leave that other point with reference to this, is that, man, just thinking about this, is that what do you hope to gain from having written behind the badge in River City? What do you have to gain with it? I know you've said, you've said a lot. In fact, you've said it. Really. <coughs> but, but, but if I were to ask you just, just one, one statement. What, it's, about, what it's about correcting the, correcting the images that are incorrect. Hmm. It's about... Um, uh, one of the things that seems to be going on right now is some revisionist history. Okay. Uh, a couple of college professors here have written some a paper that's not historically accurate. Mm -hmm. um, there's a piece coming out now called Losing Albina, mm -hmm. which is not uh, historically accurate. So it's about presenting the way it was, the way it is, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the facts. And if you're going to write something about history in Portland, you probably should come and talk to me because I was there. <laughs> There's interesting points about the riots that went on in the 1960s. I was there. I worked the riots. I had on the blue helmet. I sweat under it. I had my shotgun. I had my gun in my pocket. Oh, um, come on. Well, now, you got to remember now. <laughs> you got to understand. Uh, people like you weren't around. In fact, people weren't uh, around when I asked the uh, yeah. cops to come on and to basically yeah. share with us exactly yeah. what that work was all about. Yeah. So, so, but again, we are in a crisis, so to speak, and we people are. are reacting. And they've got all kinds of opinions out there. Yeah. And as you know, and I'm not going to get into the quote, the masters and all those degrees aspect of it. When right, one puts together a thesis, they get out there and put information together. Mm -hmm. And if people are not, like you are not around, they get they get the degree, yeah. and, and I'm not knocking it, but that's that system, okay. Mm -hmm. So, but again, uh, thank thankful. Hopefully, these people will now contact you yeah. and I'll read your book. <laughs> Law enforcement is, is at a crisis now. Yeah. The cops yeah. are under a lot of uh, scrutiny, as they always should be, but uh, there's a lot of uh, information that's incorrect about the police, and here it goes back again to who's in charge. Yeah, yeah. Who's yeah. in charge? Yeah. Because yeah. the cop. He goes to work, he gets in his car, he right. goes to work, and he does what the people ha above right. him have told him to do. Mm -hmm. And who sets the policy, mm -hmm. who sets the rules, uh, the unions do, the mayors do, the district attorneys do, those are the ones that are actually mm -hmm. uh, responsible, mm -hmm. and we need to hold those leaders accountable. Mm -hmm. The voters. The voters. We the voters. We're the one. We We're the, the one. We're responsible. Yeah. We're responsible. And I learned that. I yeah. keep going back to that same point yeah. because that's what I learned after I read the book and having mm -hmm. sat down with you and having these interviews, it's a very serious, it, it, yeah. I mean, it's very serious. That's that's the focus, and that's where we need to go. We need to go. Yeah. And because I noticed that, because uh, they have about training, a lot of people are talking about training and this, that, and the other. But again, that's all policy and guidelines mm -hmm. and this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. But again, that puts gets put together, True. and then we, the people, need to know what that is. Yes. Mm -hmm. That needs to be, that, that needs to know, whether it be profiling, whether it be shooting someone, or, or people are very disappointed about folks, some, somebody gets shot, if you will, by a cop, and they get, they, they can take off to Hawaii for a month or two, yeah, that kind of stuff, or not being interviewed uh, uh, after a sub shooting after 24 hours yeah. or something. You, you know, you said those kinds of things. Yes. And I think that's very important, even for their safety, too, you know, and that whole issue about stress, yes. you know, about stress and, and, the, and the alcoholism and drugs. and. Yeah. And being able to divorce, divorce yeah. that, that's a major stuff. So, so I, I'm saying that uh, hopefully what we've done here in the studio is that we've given them a path, if you will, towards a solution. Yes. You know, I don't like the idea of kids being called gangs. I really don't. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I, I, true community policing was a point that you had made. From the standpoint you had an area that you were responsible for if you saw somebody driving along that you didn't recognize uh, at two or three o'clock in the morning you'd stop them now that's community policing to me it is you see what i'm saying being able to know the people within the area being able to know what the kids are all about in the area you're still a law enforcement person you're not a basketball player you're a law enforcement <laughs> and don't get me wrong i realize you know people are trying to say well you need to do this this that and the other. i want you to i want you to be a law and i want a person to be i want safety i want public safety I'd like to see the cars going back, if you will, i.e. printed on the, on, the, on the car. Public safety officer, if yeah. you will. You know, uh, public safety, was it uh, law enforcement? I mean, there used to be a, there used to be a logo, a logo 
on the on the cars here from on as far as the police car is concerned. I know it was a road city, but it was public safety serving this something. What, what was protect it? Protect and serve, I believe. Protect, protect and serve. Yeah. Protect and serve. Yeah. I'd like to see that come back. Mm -hmm. And so that citizens can feel comfortable about that. Mm -hmm. Being able to walk to the store and get some milk or something in the in the evening or at night mm -hmm. or this, that, and the other walk down. Mm -hmm. Because we got a lot of seniors now yeah. that, are, that are retiring, if you will. And people don't want to be moving out their neighborhood. We got other issues mm -hmm. to concern. Police so, officers also have a responsibility, too. People need to understand that it's a police officer's responsibility in their district to make sure he knows what's going on in yeah, that district. Yeah, yeah. That's where you hold me responsible, yeah, yeah. is I'm responsible for this area. I'm going to be responsible for knowing who's in there because if I don't, then I can't protect you. Well, you 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 you're policing the community. I'm policing. The now it's community yeah. policing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a real deal, right? It is you're policing deal. the community. Yeah. So all we have to do is just reverse it a bit yeah. and whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So again, that's great. Yeah. So now let's let's get down with Teresa now. Teresa, you know you had the opportunity, getting the box, sort of like putting it together, so to speak. And then basically coming up with your own outline in terms of what you need to do to come up with this product, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So you would probably went back and things that you didn't understand, you probably went back and maybe maybe set up appointments to talk to people. And, and then you had the opportunity, because he was a cop at one point in time, to talk to those folks that he said what he said about in the piece, right? That's the legitimacy. Talk about that a little bit. Well, I didn't... What did you do? I didn't interview anyone in the book um, because most of the people in the book are dead and the people that aren't mentioned or named probably wouldn't agree to an interview. Mm -hmm, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very difficult to get police officers to talk, particularly police officers of Don's generation. Um, but what I did do is I got a copy of Don's personnel file, which helped with the book um, a lot because it corroborated dates and times and places and names. Um, there were two or three names that we had spelled incorrectly because mm. we didn't have access to those kinds of documents. But the, the personnel file was really, really instrumental in um, helping to uh, improve the accuracy of the book. Mm -hmm. But but I basically just took what he had, which was a manuscript, uh, 235 pages um, typed from 91 and 92. The pages uh -huh. were yellowing um, with age. It was about 22, 23 years old. And we just worked from that. We scanned it and then we just spent two and a half years beefing it up, adding stories to it, um, switching stories around, trying to improve the chronology mm -hmm. of events, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But it was very challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me something, was it difficult getting his file or did he pick it, it up himself? You know, it wasn't difficult at all. It just kind of happened. I really believe in destiny because I mm -hmm. wasn't even looking for it. It mm -hmm. just happened. I volunteered uh, for a couple of shifts at the police museum really? with Jim Huff. Uh, a current police officer um, told me that he needed help and I had the summer off and I contacted him and he said sure and I came out and he had me filing photographs in old personnel files mm. that are currently now over in the um, archives and records center uh, on PSU campus. Mm. So um, it was just a very uh, funny event the way it happened. It was very happenstance. Mm. And I, had, I asked him if he knew of Don's file and he said he had looked for it and couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. And then I went, and I think I only got from A to D um, when I did the filing and mm -hmm. there it was, it was the last file um, in the back of D. Really, really? <laughs> yes. Uh, 166 pages it was just one of those moments that you never forget because my heart just was in my throat and I, I wasn't expecting it mm -hmm. and there it was and I was just I was so excited because mm -hmm. I knew what it meant mm -hmm. to the book mm -hmm. well what, what about what about uh, other uh, what about other uh, police officers if you will, who had retired if you will uh, were they uh, accommodating were you able to, uh, well I mean I've interviewed I've interviewed eight police officers eight. In, including a woman including a female police officer um, and I've learned a great deal from those interviews mm -hmm. because they're all long interviews. I wanted them to have the opportunity to speak their mind, mm -hmm. share their experiences, mm -hmm. share their perspective, share their um, opinions about various mm -hmm. things. Because too many people don't try to understand what it's like to be a police officer. Mm -hmm. All we can really do, all I can do as a mm -hmm. civilian, is try to understand what it must be like. Mm -hmm. Too many people, um, as Don said once, they paint all police officers with the same brush. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong, mm -hmm. because that's not, it's not good to do that for any person, mm -hmm. you know. It's not good to generalize or to label any mm -hmm. group of people. Mm -hmm. And too many people do that with cops. Mm -hmm. Anybody that wants to look at my personnel file 
It's available. It's public record. That's, that's public, public record. record. Yeah. That's, that's but, the but you said the part. history. You, you went yeah. to the museum, right? You went to the museum. Mm -hmm. well, is, is that where they, all the public records are? They well, were they there. were. Mm -hmm. They were there mm -hmm. until the word got out that they were there. <laughs> and then some things happened, and they wait were... Minute, wait, 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 wait. Well, wait, the archive wait. people decided they yeah. shouldn't have them. We should have them. And properly so. Because, so they were, they were hurried So now over. they're in the archives available yeah. for anybody to look at. Well, if it, 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 most, archive, what city? With the city of Portland? It's or? the city of Portland archives. Yeah. It's, it's most Portland retired city police archives. officers' yeah. personnel files are there. Okay. If you want to go down and look up your favorite retired policeman, <laughs> his file is there. The, Just there look are, through it. Get a lot. copy, take it home. Is that right? There yeah. are a lot of copies that are missing yeah. um, mm -hmm. because I know there's several, there's three or four people, men that I interviewed. Mm -hmm. Their copies, their personnel files weren't there. So it's a, it's a, it's a hodgepodge. Mm. There's a lot of copies of personnel files from the, the teens, 1915, 1920. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't find a lot from the 80s or the 90s. So there were about, um, I think I've interviewed eight police officers. Of those eight police officers, I only found um, Don's personnel file. I didn't really? find the others. But that's because they only took 120 boxes from the police museum to the archives center but I know that um, I was told that there were an equal number in the basement of the justice center mm. and I don't believe those have been um, I don't believe that those were included mm. in the shipment over to the P Portland archives and records um, but yeah um, I wasn't able to find any personnel file of any of the other police officers mm. that I interviewed mm. Mm. Um, so. tell, tell me something you know, you again. You you edit this this book, mm -hmm. and uh, we've done this piece with with Don, and you met me, and we we basically mm -hmm. talked. You you list, you heard us in terms of the interviews. You, we've had Stuart Fred Stewart here at one point in time, Fred, yeah. but then at the same time, we, we you hear all these things that were happening back east. Mm -hmm. You know, and and uh, and the shootings and this that and the yeah. other and whatever. And now now I'm, you're wearing your other hat now. Um, what did you think about that? Any, we any, are any in a crisis that? Okay. nationally because okay. it's 2015, because okay. everyone has a cell phone, because everyone has a video, a, 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 a camera on their mm -hmm. cell phone. They can do mm -hmm. videos. Mm -hmm. um, what happened in South Carolina? I was chilled when I saw that video mm -hmm. of Michael Slager shooting that black man in the back mm -hmm. and, and murdering him. Mm -hmm. That would never have been possible to record that 10 years ago even. Um, but we are in a crisis because there are numerous examples of really horrendous police misconduct mm -hmm. and so a lot of civilians come to the conclusion that all cops are bad mm -hmm. and that's wrong mm -hmm. and that's why people have to try to maintain a balance between those small numbers of cops who do terrible things mm -hmm. and it's probably less than one percent and the majority of police officers who are genuine good people trying to make a difference mm -hmm. and people just need to remember that and mm -hmm. you know but we are at a crisis. I mean, uh, yeah. Okay. Now you know we've thrown on the on the table about the fact who's responsible. You know that's kind of like where I've got. How did you feel about that from the standpoint of saying when we made the point? I made the point about the fact that uh, we are responsible as mm -hmm. citizens, and and we, we we basically give that responsibility to the elected official, and then they're supposed to basically do the checks and balance and this, that, and the other, and come back to us making sure that it's, it's, it's being done right, we still want public safety. Sure. How do you feel? Are we going in well, the right I direction? Well, I mean, public safety is dependent on so many different things. It's mm -hmm. not simply dependent on the conduct of police. Mm -hmm. Public safety um, is dependent on how parents raise their children. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. too many parents don't raise their children very well. Mm -hmm. And there's we, we live in a society that glorifies um, rappers who rap about killing cops. <laughs> who hate police, and sometimes they have a valid reason because there are corrupt police officers who do mm -hmm. bad things, but we, we live in a society that um, uh, it, it's, it's just difficult. Mm -hmm. It's difficult not to go to one extreme, and that's what I see. I see a lot of people going to one extreme. Mm -hmm. You know, they either love cops, and no matter what they do, that's okay, or they despise cops, mm -hmm. and they're all rotten. It's not good to entertain that kind of mentality because we need to be balanced somewhere in the center. We need to have a, a more balanced uh, outlook on law enforcement. Um, but in terms of how to um, how to lessen crime, 
um, that's a that's a it takes a village. Yeah, yeah, right. It takes a village, and it's not mm -hmm. just up to police. Mm -hmm. It's up to parents mm -hmm. because, honestly, um, the character of your child is determined number one mm -hmm. by their home life, by what mm -hmm. kind of example they have in terms of a father or a mother, mm -hmm. and police simply can't fulfill that role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I remember the, the the brief lyrics of one rap song that really irritated me at the time. Got a 12 gauge, sawed off, got some cops gonna dust off. Mm -hmm. That's, what does that tell our kids? Mm -hmm. What does that tell our kids? These rappers are probably responsible for a lot of these gang shootings. Mm -hmm. I got a 12 gauge, sawed off, gonna dust off some cops, that's mm -hmm. bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, you make a point, and let me, I'm gonna throw one back on you. You had made mention when we started talking about this, the, 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 uh, the possum incident. Yeah. up in northeast Portland and we, we talked about it briefly and you made the point about what well, Bruce the reason why they did that was because they were they were angry about this the Stevens there yes. the marine that was that was strangled well right. basically choked to death mm -hmm. so to speak and killed him you know they said you want to expand a bit on that a little bit how, how did they get to the point that, where they were angry to the point that they were able to, they, they did that kind of thing? It was kind of, it was kind of like, like I said, my reaction was, was I got involved in that whole deal. It was like somebody just threw out some coons or whatever and they wanted to make a point about black folks in Northeast I Portland. think they were angry at the two cops that got um, in trouble for it. But why would they do the, that? The, the problem was, of course, this was that they, my time. Yeah. the chokehold, which had been effective for years and years, yeah. okay. was now held up as, right. this has got to stop. Right. Okay. And they were angry about the tool that they'd been using successfully, myself included. Mm -hmm. okay. I choked yeah. lots and lots of people, I never killed anybody. Yeah. So they were angry that the fact that the tool they'd been using was now, was now uh, no longer acceptable. Mm -hmm. And then they exercised really bad judgment okay. by killing possums and throwing it in front of the, uh, the burger barn, which was um, and the t-shirts. Yeah. It was a black and, business, and the yeah. It was yeah. a black business and the t-shirt yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. You know, it was, but it really had a major impact on black people. It did. And, and it myself, should have. I was, I was sure. a push of the observer at that point in time. And that's why we marched downtown. Mm -hmm. Don't choke them, point. smoke them. Yeah, that was just incredibly yeah. naive nonsense for these officers to do that. I yeah. still think they should have yeah. suffered more than they did yeah. because of yeah. it. Because when you have that kind of mentality, wow. Mm -hmm. But like I said, that's history now. Hopefully, it's history, it's hopefully yeah. going into the right direction <coughs> at this point in time. Now, tell me this, uh, Teresa, back, back, uh, Don, you can also throw out this. Now, as a reaction to this book, what kind of reactions have you gotten? One, from the from the police community, and two, from <laughs> folks that, that you might have interviewed. Don, what kind of reaction did well, you Well, what get? I'm laughing about is I haven't gotten any, any yeah, reaction. Oh, wow. You know, wow. uh, I'm, I'm still waiting for somebody to argue with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to say anything. You did such a good job. The, I know you did a good job on me. I got you here three, the, three, the, yeah. three weeks in a row. The, a lot of the police officers are uh, that have read it, and I know they have, mm -hmm. um, are saying, "Yeah, you're good because you're bringing some really good points." Good. A lot of them are, are a lot of them are thinking to themselves, "No, you're okay. full of baloney." Okay. You know, uh, this is wrong, that's wrong, but they don't come out and say. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're not challenging me. They're not calling in and saying, "Well, I don't believe this. I don't believe that." So it's kind of like the silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I well, wish, well, the I other wish, thing is, it's yeah. we're, we only published this in the the, la yeah, the right. last part of February, so mm -hmm. March, April, May. It's been about three and a half months, so mm -hmm. we're still in the infancy of this process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but. Um, what we have heard from most people has only been positive. There's a few yeah. reviews on Amazon.com. They're all glowing reviews. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it's a great book. It's a good book um, in the sense that narratively it's entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, it's very descriptive. Yeah, um, and it's, it's as chronologically mm -hmm. correct as I was able to make it. Um, but it's it's an important book because it really shows the process of burnout and that's the theme of the book mm -hmm. the theme of the book is the arc mm -hmm. and the process of burnout mm -hmm. he goes from being a kid the safety patrol to being a teenager in the back of the coffee brothers patrol car to becoming a young police officer and everything that goes everything that that entails until he gets to the point where he's burnt out he's mm -hmm. discouraged he's physically suffering because of a you know high blood pressure a bleeding ulcer mm -hmm. and depression and um, I've read several studies on criminology and the, the age, the typical age for a, a, 20, a 15 to 20 year veteran to basically opt out is 42. Mm -hmm. And he was 42. Mm -hmm. 
He, he was he was textbook in the sense that he was burnt out. He wasn't getting support um, at a time when there was there just wasn't a lot of support, which is I mean, it's good now that officers have more access to psychological services and counseling uh, today, because back when Don was an officer, you just either you just you just manned up or you you, mm -hmm. you know left mm -hmm. and he, d he did police work for as long as he could and mm -hmm. then he resigned mm -hmm. so and just a little bit more in regards to the today today's cop yeah what, what do you think you, you... today's cop is suffering the same burnout mm -hmm. the yeah. same stress yeah uh, police work hasn't changed technology yeah. has added some good things and some bad things but i still think that they ought to be able to retire when they're at 15 years yeah. mm -hmm. because once you once you're starting to go to work with an attitude you know, oh well, I got another put in another yeah. eight hours. Yeah. I got to listen to some more of this nonsense. Right. It's time to go, and they should be able to go honorably, yeah. mm -hmm. not uh, not have to uh, worry about their future. And and mm -hmm. we've seen that kind of burnout with um, officers like Sean Southern, an excellent police officer mm -hmm. by all uh, reputation, um, and he ended up with an alcohol problem. And other officers who have. Um, indicated through their behavior that they're really suffering from burnout mm -hmm. um, it's it's true I agree with Don that they should be allowed to retire at about 15 years because anything beyond that they, they get to a point where they've heard it all they've seen mm -hmm. it all everybody lies to them so they can mm -hmm. trust nobody because everyone's a liar mm -hmm. um, they get so cynical that they just can't be as engaged mm -hmm. because they stop caring mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on police work but yes. I'm just speculating you have a degree well it's in criminology but <laughs> yeah. not police work she has a degree in criminology you know, no, I heard that it's, it's the same thing you're talking <laughs> about this yeah. <laughs> now the other thing I was going to ask you about in terms of how our so-called spokesman reacted to a shooting, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the art thing, whatever, yeah. and reacted by saying, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get three more cops assigned to the gang unit. Yeah. Well, why do we have to have a gang unit? Why can't we just have a police, you know, why, why can't police do the work? Well, why do we have to have a, a gang unit? I mean, that's, that's, those are some have, questions they that love, folks have They love the specialization. We're the vice squad. We do vice. We're the arson investigators. We do arson. We're the gang squad. We do gang. I agree with you. It should be just police work. No, but, I disagree. But, but okay, well, well, the, the gang unit is important. The gang unit is important. But, but, is important. but, but yeah, I know, but my point is that, again, that, that's a concern in the right. black community. Because, yeah. one, it was a gang. Whenever you think about gang, it's black. That's true. I'm just straight up. It's, it's gang is black. Yeah. Okay. And they reacted to three more three more cops at a gang in, mm -hmm. the, in the black community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, quote. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, consequently, everybody's open to that. Mm -hmm. Let's get some more kids on the list. Yeah. They're gang members, and their li their whole life is gone. Yeah, there's a list yeah. running around. Yeah. See, well, so I'm just saying that those are some of the things that you brought out that brought 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 out was brought out in the books, but people are calling me about this whole thing. Yeah. See what I'm saying? So my point is, the leader reacted that way. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, he should have reacted one to Portland Public Schools and says, "Okay, fine, we're going to have yeah. bulk ed to make sure that those kids get mm -hmm. get some opportunity to get a job or something of that nature." But I was yeah. I was concerned about that. Adding more policemen is not particularly the answer. Okay. You know, sure, if you're under, if you're under, if there's only two or three and you need more, you should get more. But you're right. It's 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 not the policeman's job to correct the problem being corrected in the first place. Mm -hmm. Adding more policemen to the gang unit mm -hmm. isn't necessarily going to do anything. Mm -hmm. You need to add this to the school. Why are these kids out there in the first place? You need to do something the about parents. the parents. Mm -hmm. Why is your kid out mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. What did you do about it? Mm -hmm. Whose gun did they use? Where did they get it? Mm -hmm. well, that's a whole other issue, though. And mm -hmm. I think that the, the reason we need specialized units is because there's a lot involved with gang investigation that's different from vice investigation or sex crimes or homicide. So I support the specialization of units. Mm -hmm. I think it's necessary. But I guess my point is that what happened be before that? There was no such thing as gang. Exactly, and and it's taken this long. It's taken 30, 35 years since then since the gangs from L.A. came to Portland in '85. Yeah, but again, to blacks, really, but we're still talking right, about black. Right, and I, that, right. That's a bad word. I know. Okay, you know what I'm just saying because we see how the young young people up in Southeast Portland, they're yeah. all over the place. For that yeah. Matter. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, anyway, that's another discussion, okay. right? Another book you can put together for us. <laughs> oh, no problem. Lord. I'll, you can write mine. You can write mine. Well, look, folks, this has been great. The, the, the three weeks have been just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do now is going to give the public the opportunity to, to look at what we've done. We've done them together purposely sure. so they can look at the book. 
and use that as a reference guide, if you will, and then go to YouTube and, and get more background in the discussions we're having. So, again, thank you very, very much for that. Thank piece. you. Appreciate it very us. much. Okay, good. <laughs> we're going to take a short break, folks, and we'll come right back. But, again, get to that YouTube. Go out there and check this book out and get involved. Good. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Again, welcome back, if you will, folks. And this will be kind of like a well, sort of a wrap up on the, the whole issue of, uh, of police work and the, all this good information that we've gotten uh, from Don Dupre and, and the idea of being able to read the book here. And it's available, by the way, behind the badge in River City. And so I thought maybe we'd bring a lay person on board. He was on this last show, and, and I'm talking about Fred Stewart. Mm -hmm. Fred's a local businessman, a former Marine Jarhead. Uh, community person, very, very active in community, um, uh, very, very active in, in issues across the board. And, uh, you know, and I, I think it's very important and, and not afraid to speak his mind, which is a, which is very, very important. Um, and I've always said that I think he should take that second jump, you know, if you will, and maybe consider uh, uh, being one of the, being running for office or something. I mean, but, but I don't know, I'm, I might be able to convince him. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Fred. How you doing? How you doing, Bruce? Good, good, good. So, what we want to do this time around, and then I wanted to keep, I wanted to keep Don here at this point in time, is get, uh, get, get kind of wrap up from the these representing the citizens are out there, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of get a feel for uh, what what the, from his perspective, what do he feels about law enforcement today, and uh, and all of the activities that are happening along that line. In fact, Fred's a, Fred's a, has talked to many police officers and the like, and. Um, and so and then at the same time, I wanted them to give us a feel for what we've done here at, at Cable for the last three, for the last three uh, Sundays, of that matter. And is this going to maybe help solve some of the problems with what we presented here at, at, uh, at Portland Cable? What do you think, Fred? Talk. Well, the only way it, anything we've talked about here on, on your show, Bruce, um, if it's going to help, is if it gets people... Put to start asking up questions. So they can see, if no, it gets put it up, there, put it up, there, there we go. go. There you go. If it gets people to start asking questions, okay. Um, I mean, people. Uh, questions what, like what? Well, what are we going to do about our gang problem? Okay. What are we going to do about lowering violence in Portland in general? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do um, to address uh, the, the needs that our cops have? Um, if people out there feel that a, a police officer or any human being, because a police officer is just a human being, just like the rest of us, can face the trials and tribulations that they do to protect us for an extended period of time, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and not have some sort of emotional or mental um, damage, much like our military guys who go over into combat. A lot of our cops, especially our beat cops, uh, they've seen more in their career than a Marine who spent a year in uh, a hot zone, unless that Marine has seen an extensive amount of combat. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of these uh, uh, police officers we've got, 
um, are former military and have seen actual combat overseas. And then they come to America back home and they see combat on the streets here. And uh, unless something's happened very, very recently, uh, the police department does very little to give support to the police officer and their families. And any of you out there who have um, but it's a career. Had a military. It, it is a career, right? Well, it's a career like me in the military. Yeah, it's a career anybody, like anybody else, right? It, but anybody who's been but, in the military but, or rel related to somebody who's been in the military understands what I'm talking about, about issues that come up. Well, I'm, I'm and, and, uh, and many years ago, a, 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 a guy told me a thing with Oren Volstad from the Morrison Center. He told me something that I still think about today when I'm looking at problems and challenges. He says, all res unresolved issues will resolve themselves but usually will not resolve themselves in a positive way. Mm -hmm. So if we want a lot of the issues that come up in the, in the, in the time of a police officer is a police officer, if we want those to be resolved in a positive way, we're going to have to expect the people we vote for take proactive action mm -hmm. and bring in the tools mm -hmm. and, and other things. But bottom line, nothing's really going to matter about anything we've said on this show if the people who are watching it don't take some proactive action on themselves and, and start asking questions. Um, we've got a year, uh, almost a year, before the, the, the primary elections. So you've got plenty of time to figure out what questions you want to ask and then the, ask those questions and then listen. Very important to listen to what the people who want to re represent us say when you ask them these questions. Well, tell me this. What, did this help a bit with reference to the book that Don has put together? I think, I think Don's book is a gift. In the conversation I mean, we've had here. If you want to understand part, part of the problem with our Portland police, you've got to read Don's book. It's like a 50-year history of bad habits. Mm -hmm. A lot of the habits that Don talks about in this book, cops still have to this very day here in Portland right now. So, uh, you know, for me, anybody who's serious about uh, making things better in, 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 in Portland, and, 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 and personally, with my view, I think we're at a point in time where the community is saying we need a change in how law enforcement um, is, mm -hmm. what their general orders are. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily need uh, a, a, a police department based on the 1910 model of policing. We need a model that's more like 2010, what it should have been in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a great history history lesson that I think everybody who cares about uh, good policing and the changes that we need to make mm -hmm. should read. Now, you know, you, you talk to a number of the cops. Uh, you're very familiar with these guys and, and whatever. What do they say about this? We've, we've done these shows and whatever. Don's got the book out there. What are they saying on the street? I've asked a few cops, retired cops, about it. I haven't talked to any cops that are currently um, um, serving, but it's, it's mixed. Some, um, they, cops don't like talking about other cops and they don't like other cops talking about other cops. <laughs> they don't. Um, Marines are kind of that way as far as Marines don't like to talk about their guys in their unit unless it's good stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they don't like other people talking about guys in their unit. So you, you should understand that a lot. Anybody who's been in, in the military. Well, cops look at themselves as a unit. You know what I mean? Where like every cop in their in their in in, in, in the department is part of their unit. They just it, it's just bad juju. But uh, I've been surprised. Um, a, a couple of guys have said some you know some positive things about the book. Yeah. You know. But you know I'm going to respect them. I'm not going to talk about their names and stuff like that. They still have to feel good when they're sitting down with their fellow you know fellow police officers, retired or not. What 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 sort of feedback have you gotten from the standpoint that and it's been sort of a perception perception that the Portland police runs the city. Well, you know they could. Phil Stanford and a couple other people tell me the Portland police still do, but there is no doubt that at least up until the maybe as late as nineteen eighty, but for sure when he was when he became a police officer in nineteen sixty the Portland police ran this town. They did. My grandfather said it. All of his old retired criminal friends <laughs> said it. You know, if you wanted to do anything in this town criminal minded, if the Portland police didn't approve it, you just disappeared. <laughs> and there was nobody that was going to be looking for you. But where are we today? Should we continue along that path? I mean, from what I'm hearing and what I'm reading right here, well, that's not the way we well, need to go. Well, we. I think there's an easy way to change. I think... The old days, maybe that was efficient. Okay. You know, maybe it was efficient. But with technology now, 
there's a lot more uh, education in our community. Yeah. You know, even people who haven't graduated high school uh, can educate themselves at a level that nobody could, you know, 50 years ago. I, but they're people all degrees now. But, but they're all degreed for example. But people, but, but people have some... changed. Society has changed. Yeah. We may need to be looking at how we need to change law enforcement to meet the way we are today. Like I said, back in the '60s, they were still based on how, you know, crime worked back in you know 1910, oh, yeah. where a cop literally knew where all the bad actors were, where there were bosses, like real bosses. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, bosses like if we had them today, they're very quiet about it. <laughs> you know, we don't have that today. Not in, in well, coming. people need to realize, too, that police work is a unique profession. Right. There's nothing like it. The military is not exactly like it. It's a unique profession, and it has to be treated uniquely. These people have to be, mm -hmm. uh, have to have more support from the community. You know, you shoot somebody or you, you get this stress out, you know, this 15-year retirement that I like. It's because it's unique, and it needs to be treated unique. So the leaders... The mayor, the commissioners, they need to understand that this is not just police work in general. This is a unique profession, and it has to be treated specially. We have to address it differently than we address the Park Bureau or the Water Bureau and the retirement problem. It's unique. It needs to be treated differently. But under this uniqueness, do you feel police of today will, will respect uh, the leadership in terms of uh, uh, them identifying the signing off on the policies and guidelines of police work? What do you think about that? I think that they are scared of any change. They're I think, scared of any change. I think that the police are scared of any change. They don't want change. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons that some of this uh, internal affairs violation of the 14th Amendment continues mm -hmm. is because they don't want change. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of it. They yeah. like it the way it is. They like being in charge. Don's right. I mean, my first experience dealing with cops not liking change was the big brouhaha in the Portland Police Department back in the 90s when the Portland Police decided to put computers in their cars so they could look, you know, look up things, you know, look up driver's license, look up... And uh, a lot of the older cops freaked and said, you, you can't be a good cop fiddling with a toy like that. You know, we were looking at this great advancement, putting more information in the hands of cops, especially when they're doing, you know, pulling people over, you know, for traffic stops and stuff, which was really one of the big motivating factors why the Portland police wanted to get it. Mm -hmm. But the old cops did not like change at all, and we actually had a handful of cops retire. They specifically retired a little early, so they didn't have to deal with what they call a toy in a cop, I mean, in a police car. They were not going to do it. Some guy, I remember telling me, some cop told me, his uh, notepad, was all he needed. Yep. His notepad and his memory. That's all he needed. And he says, anything I don't need, have on my notepad on my, on my, uh, in my memory, I can get on the radio. And he, he was dead serious, and this is the 1990s. So cops in general, historically, are slow to change. But what this, a city has to look at is where it needs to go, yep. you know? And a city, what the city has to do is make the changes today. And you're gonna lose some people. If a person can't, you know, uh, the public servant go with the direction that the public wants or what the public needs, and maybe it's best that they find something else better to do. Mm -hmm. But the new people coming in, you know, they'll conform to what the people want. Mm -hmm. You know, we and you know it's unfortunate, <laughs> but it's like any other profession. If you work in a company and the company decides to make some yeah. changes, and the people mm -hmm. who could go along with those changes, mm -hmm. they get to stay. Mm -hmm. The people who can't go along with those changes. You know, they got to find something else better to do. Follow up on that, Don. What do you think? I had, I had a stack of three employee. by five cards. Go on. I had a stack of three by five cards. We didn't have a computer. And everything I knew about you, I wrote it down on the card. Mm -hmm. If you had a mug shot, I had it in there. And I put it in a little gray box. Mm -hmm. And it was in my briefcase and it was in the back seat. Mm -hmm. So that was my file. Mm -hmm. That was my file. Technology wasn't around. Yep. You know, that was how, that's how, how would you feel it. if you had a, a laptop that you could look up Everybody. I think it's so, so. I think it's terribly distracting for one thing. We're, we're the citizens are not allowed to use their cell phones. These cops are. It's wrong. Hmm. Hmm. But well, what about when they've stopped? I see a lot of cops pull over uh, to the side. I and, hope so. Yeah. I hope so. There's yeah. been a lot of police crashes because they're 
computing when they should be driving, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. It's it's technology. Can you stop it? I don't know. Well, like is I said, the, the, the change idea? thing the change thing is a key. And I guess change, the other yeah. thing I'm going to throw out on the table, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, does a cop recognize who the employer is? No, okay. because they're not held responsible okay. to their employer. Okay. Okay. That's the insulating okay. factor that they don't want to change. Yeah. 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 If you were held responsible to the people you work for, the citizens, yeah. then I don't know of any other profession that's not held responsible yeah. to their employees. And the only, way, only thing we can do that, do that, is that we got to make sure that we we elect the person that, if you will, that can supervise that deal for us, yes. right? Yes. Well, one so thing what, in defense and cops, I will say is one thing that I think hasn't happened in our in our city, mm -hmm. maybe ever, but definitely is not going on right now. Is it is not clear what the entire mission of, of the Portland police is right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, how sh is, does the city of Portland, as far as from the mayor on down, mm -hmm. how are they expecting the Portland police to approach crime and resolving cr uh, issues in Portland? Um, you know, the DA is part of that. Yeah. Uh, the DA doesn't think they're part of it, but that's yeah. where the citizens let the DA know Public about it. Because yeah. honestly, it is very demoralizing for a cop to put somebody they know as a threat in jail, you know, arrest him, and then see that person literally walk out, you know, hours later. Um, especially when they know we've got a vacant jail, you know, here in this county. They don't understand how that affects morale, how that affects the whole process of a person being committed mm -hmm. to doing their job. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the DA knows nobody's going to hurt me or my family because then the federal government, the Marines, and everybody goes after you. But your average mom and dad out there, they don't, they're not the DA. Their wives and their, hus I mean, their husbands or their, their kids don't have this cloak of protection mm -hmm. like, you know, Rod Underhill does. Rod Underhill knows it's going to make international news. Come at the DA. The DA. If somebody touches him or his family, you know what I mean? So they're kind of safe. Mm -hmm. The criminals know, bad people know, you touch Rod Underhill or his family, you know, they're going to call in the Marines for you. <laughs> you understand? But they're not going to do that for your mm -hmm. average Portlander. Mm -hmm. You understand? So when a criminal does something, uh, rapes somebody, att attempts to rape somebody, we've got a lot of domestic violence out there where women are scared. You know, they got a guy who's actually tried to, you know, hurt them. When a cop sees people like that go to jail for hours and then come back out, it's kind of demoralizing. It, you know, it shows that the city and the county, they really don't have a plan or an understanding of how to approach violent crime but right then now. on the other side, I'm going to throw this out there. But now with the advent of the smartphone, <laughs> what about those atrocities? What do you mean? My point is that there's a lot of that stuff going on, you know, from the standpoint of, the bad, as you say, the bad cop. Correct. And, the, and, and, and in today's criteria is that you got the bad cop, but they get released. Well, I think we done. would have fewer bad cops if we addressed a PTSD issue. If we had a more clear understanding of what kind of police work we wanted, okay, because that goes into who we recruit and who we allow to become. And who a cop. needs to put that, put that, put that program? Well, those together. it comes down to one in Portland, the number one person, whoever is our mayor, and then who, two. You don't know your mayor? Oh well, Charlie Hales. Okay, all right. But it's, <laughs> but the thing is, this problem existed before Charlie came in. I know, but now, right okay. now, it's his pro it's his problem to right. try to resolve. Right. But this is a problem that he inherited. The the issue, and and and, and also it was it was around when Shrunk was, Rod Underhill's. Uh, a, a, the, DA. A, the, the current DA, he inherited a lot of stuff. Now, it's his job right now, it is, it is uh, Hale's job right now to, to, to improve it, to make things better. And part of that is communicating to the police how we're going to approach crime in this town, right, right, right. especially violent crime. Right. And then two, communicate that to the public. Say, public, this is how we're going to approach crime. Right, yeah. And allow the public to have some serious feedback on mm -hmm. that. You know, I think if the people we voted for started taking that direction into addressing, uh, uh, you know, issues of threat and how to police us, mm -hmm. I think we're going to see lower, lower crime, especially violent crime. But we're also going to see fewer bad cops or, or fewer cops acting out because sometimes we've had some bad cops just have a bad day. And the mm -hmm. bad thing is when a bad cop, when a good cop has a bad day, it it leaves a lasting impression. And it's on YouTube in 20 minutes. And, and not just <coughs> and not just that. It could also meet, t change a person's life, you know, unnecessarily. You understand? So, mm -hmm. like I said, we've, we've, we're, I think we're at a, at a turning point where we've got to look at, at the whole issue of law enforcement mm -hmm. and, and policing globally. Mm -hmm. And we, we had to stop mentioning this thing called community policing just yet 
because we've never had community policing. But we, we did. We talked about this. Well, he, he not in my lifetime. He knew yeah. his community. No, he knew yeah. his community. Not in my lifetime. He was policing his area, and so but we just yeah. reversed not, it. Not right? in my lifetime. We, yeah. we, a cop can't do what Don did and the cops that he served uh, today. They just can't. They're, they're in their cars too much. There's too much on them. We don't have enough police officers on the police force to allow us to have cops who are involved in the community at the level that Don was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. We just numerically don't have it. We actually had, when Don, when Don was a police officer, we actually had more cops, numerically, more cops in the city of Portland than we did today, do today. We had over 1,000 cops back when he was a police officer. 700. No, no. 700. 1967. He's a cop now. He... I know, but 1967, the official number was like 1,100. Yeah, look, that's what no, one, of the, one of the things that needs to be addressed too is more attention to the juvenile problem mm -hmm. because I can remember more times than I want to. I arrested a juvenile, mm -hmm. took him down to the juvenile division. Mm -hmm. He was out in a couple hours and he, committing another crime. I arrested him twice in the same day. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. what does that say about responsibility? What does that say about? holding people responsible. And never. The juveniles are rarely held responsible mm -hmm. and they go oh, on now you're eighteen, oh, now you're going to prison. Well but we had but we had early childhood development. Now we came up with a new model, if you will, and that was supposed to hopefully address some of those issues. No, yeah, it's it failed. I mean we've had like like I was saying to some people uh, you know earlier today about you know Albina Head Start. Albina Head Start is an absolute failure because a lot of the five hundred black men and, and and well, black people who have been murdered in gang violence, and a lot, most of their murderers probably went to Head Start, <laughs> and most of the victims probably went to Head Start. Mm -hmm. I mean, a hundred years ago, people are going to be looking back at Albina Head Start and going, "Wow, what a good con!" Uh, you know what I mean? There were fewer black people being murdered before Albina Head Start than afterwards. But you know, Don, there's something you just said here that I think is very, very fascinating. Back in the 1960s, we had a population in Portland of what, 250,000? Yeah. Like around there. Yes. He, in his opinion, they had 700 cops. The official number was 1,100. But let's say it was just 700. Today, the, depending on who you talk to, we got between 650 and 750 as far as 1,000 people. 650 to 750,000 people. Mm -hmm. We only have about 930 uh, police officers. So we've got three times more cops. I mean, uh, p um, population, probably four times uh, the, po uh, the 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 uh, the territory, and we have you know only about 200 more cops from what, from his memory. And also remember this: most of Portland, that's current Portland today, east of 82nd, wasn't in, uh, annexed back then. That's right. Most of it. Matter of fact, if you get into northeast Portland, most of 60th and east wasn't annexed yet. So we've got a territory that's probably four times more than it was back then, but only about 200 more cops. Mm. And I bet most of those 200 more cops aren't street cops. Mm. I bet only about, I'd be surprised if it was 50 of them were actually on the street. Wow. I, I bet we have only about 50 more cops actually on the street today yeah. than we did 50 years ago, mm. numerically. Well, that's what we were talking about. That was another yeah. uh, When they expanded, they took the sheriff's office officers and made them Portland policemen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> So that expanded it somewhat. That's probably where most of that 200 came from. Yeah. Hmm. That's right. But but for the essentially, you can say that our police force, though the the space that we're covering and the, and the population we're yeah. covering is larger, hmm. the Portland police have not in, you know increased in size. Hmm. You know, we're, it's kind of fascinating hmm. that um, things haven't gotten you know even worse than they are. Hmm. But then again, it goes back to what I tell everybody. I don't feel. A city like Portland should have the violent level that we've got right now. Yeah, yeah. That's just not yeah, yeah. part of our makeup I in this town. That. We're not L.A. That's right. that's We're right. not New York. That's right. That's you know, right. That's right. We, there is no excuse yeah. for the level of violence. Everything from domestic violence to gang violence yeah. Yeah. to some of the violence that we're seeing in our nightclubs. I agree with that. <laughs> I mean, it's... Yeah, I agree. It doesn't make any sense. Let me ask you something. Uh, thinking about the Don, is when Miranda, when that Miranda thing came up, you know, from the standpoint you had to state yeah. whatever this, this, that, that. When did that, that come, did that come in when you were there? Yes. When did it come in? <clears throat> in the 60s. I don't in remember the, the exact date, okay. but it was the 60s. And what good has it done? Has, has it done? Well, it really it hasn't done. It really never made any difference. It scared a lot of policemen because they thought, well, now if I tell you, you don't have to talk to me. Mm -hmm. You won't. But the, uh, that really never happened. <clears throat> as a detective, 
when I was interrogating people, these are your rights. You sign the little card. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about this. Okay. So mostly they do. <laughs> there seems to be a compulsion to confess. You know, if you did wrong. I remember my I remember my supervisor, Myron Warren. He said that if pe the only ones that really never talked to me were the ones that really got away. Mm -hmm. Because he could make most people talk to you. Some of these investigators were pretty good at interrogating people. I was one of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Skokel was another one. Mm -hmm. He was an expert. He could get you to say anything. Mm -hmm. So the Miranda really had no effect after the initial scare. So, and I don't think it has any effect today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. If I tell you to you, if I tell you, you have the right to remain silent. Shut up. <laughs> now I want to point out something. This is one of the areas I think causes a lot of PTSD with. Um, cops one of, one of my friends one of our mutual friends um charles jensen see they call him cw yeah, jensen yeah, CW, yeah. i think one of the charles jensen to this day is affected by the wesley allen dodd case and he gave wesley allen dodd the, the miranda rights and said you don't have to talk and those of you who don't remember should definitely google up that case one of the most horrible child molesting cases we've ever had uh C.W. was the guy who interviewed him and sat in a room with him for six hours and listened to this guy talk about everything he had ever done to a kid. Wow. Everything. I mean, graphically. He had to write all that down, had to record it, for, you know, so they could make sure they, they have a case against this guy. And then he went in and told CW what he wanted to do to kids and couldn't get to do, oh. and they needed that too for they the you know, for them. the investigation. Wow. I think wow. that does nothing but cause PTSD for cops. Wow. Wow. Well, evidently we've got quite a bit more discussion on this issue, but at least we started. Yeah, we started the discussion. I think it's very very important. Fred, want to thank you. Uh, because I had a friend, we like your openness and your op opinion because we need to talk about this issue. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. We're in Portland, Oregon. We're not Chicago. We're not L.A. We have an opportunity to do something, maybe even share with the rest of the country of how to do it right. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for being with us. Appreciate it. Hey, My pleasure. And for you out there, hey, you heard it. Talk among yourselves. Get, get together and talk. Play it over again. Say uh, whatever. The fact of the matter is these folks had the courage to come up here and do something, especially behind the badge in River City gives you the primer Put it up so okay you can see it. on that piece okay here it is right there you can just basically look at what we've been talking about and just kind of read this up this document right here and you'll be in good shape okay take care have a good one see you next week guys thanks <laughs>